Good afternoon. Um, it's good to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, let me pray for us, and then we'll dig into this text. Father, thank you that all we have, all we need, is Christ. God, I pray that you would satisfy our hearts today so that we would continue to long for him until we see him face to face. God, you are so good, and I pray that you would use your word to draw our hearts closer to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for the invitation. Um, it's been a while since I've been to chapel, and um, this time for me serves as a good reminder of how God sustained me through seminary and how God has sustained me since I graduated. Um, I pray that the same might be true for you as well as you reflect on the 10 years of Bethlehem College and Seminary and just thinking, wow, this faithfulness is a reminder that God can be faithful in the future. Um, so I pray that even this text um, would be a good occasion for that to happen. So the text from, for today comes from Colossians 1, 9 through 14, but I want to begin reading in verse 3. Um, this is Paul writing to the church of Colossae. Verse 3 says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Verse 9, And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So the main point of this passage, this text, is this. Paul prays that the Colossian church would be filled with the knowledge of God's will so that they can walk or live in a manner worthy of the Lord. Paul then describes this walking or this worthy living as bearing fruit, increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened for endurance, and giving thanks to God the Father. The main point of this sermon, however, is this. Prayer is one important means that God uses for the sake of his people persevering in their faith. To say it more concisely, God uses prayer, yours, others, so that people, you, others, persevere. Or simply put, prayer is a means for perseverance. Like the prayer that we're going to look at today, it 
embodies, embodied in it is this prayer for perseverance. So that is a petition inside the prayer. But what I'm going to argue today is that outside this prayer, what's fueling this prayer is a conviction that prayer is a means for perseverance. And the way I came to this conclusion was this nagging question. If they are doing well, we read that, they're doing well, I've heard of your faith, your good works, you're bearing fruit, just like those who have heard the gospel all over the world. If Paul heard that, why does he say, since the day we heard, we have not ceased praying for you? I think, no, I want to argue, I believe, that Paul has a conviction that prayer is God's means for perseverance. It's one of his means for perseverance. And the way I want to structure the sermon is by asking two questions and then end with two points of application. The first question is, why pray? And the second question is, why persevere? So my desire is to stir in your hearts and my heart, especially my heart, a desire, a fervency to pray, not only for ourselves, but also for others. Um, You know, that verse, Philippians 2, count others more significant than yourselves, or don't look only to your own interests, but also the interests of others. So I want to stir in us, through God's word, a fervency to pray for others. And then I want to stir in us a desire to persevere. So first question, why pray? And more specifically, why does Paul pray? Um, And maybe you can add this to your arsenal as you look for reasons to pray in the morning, look for reasons to pray throughout the day. So why does Paul pray? And why are we spending so much time on Paul's prayer? Um, It's a good question because if you do some research, Prayers were often embedded within letters, correspondence, not just with Christians, but even non-Christians. There was a sense of, hey, we pray for you, for your well-being, your safe travel. So all throughout this literature that we read about, prayer is embedded in the Thanksgiving section of a letter. But Paul's prayers are different. It's just like when my friend You know, normal people just say, God bless you, when somebody sneezes. My friend, he would say, may God bless you, and may he cause you to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I would say, yo, they just sneezed. Just relax. (laughs) But for some reason, he felt compelled to say that. His blessing was a little bit different. Paul's prayers are a little bit different they hit in a different way. And as I studied this passage, I saw at least five reasons why Paul saw prayer as an important means for perseverance. So reason number one, Paul's prayer is against false teachers and false doctrine. One reason that Paul is writing this letter is to combat the false teachers, the false doctrine that might be deceiving this church. You see this in Colossians 2, 4. It says, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive by the philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So throughout this letter, Paul is either warning or he's refuting, he's correcting countering the false teaching and false teachers. But he prays in verse 9, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So this is the main petition, and everything else flows from that. It's used to describe it, but this is the main petition. I want you to have knowledge of his will, spiritual understanding, Notice, 
that the petition parallels the reason he wrote the letter. So, Paul could have just wrote the letter. He could have just said, hey, here's some good teaching. Replace that. Use this to counter the bad teaching. But no, he says, I'm praying for you that you would have knowledge and understanding, wisdom, so that false teachers might not lead you astray from the truth. Paul not only writes, but he prays because he believes that prayer is a means for perseverance. Second reason, Paul has not ceased praying since the day he first heard. Notice that Paul says that he did not cease praying since the day he heard of their faith. Not when he heard of the threats of the false teachers, but the day he heard of their faith. Verse four, he heard of their faith and their love for the saints. Verse 5 and 6, he heard that they had been bearing fruit just like others around the world who also had heard the gospel. Verse 7 and 8, Epaphras, one of Paul's fellow workers, he witnessed their faith, witnessed their good works, and brought a report back to Paul. So Paul has heard good news. This is not like the Galatian church, the Corinthian church, where Paul is a little bit worried, anxious, What's happening there? No, this is a good report. So he's heard good news, and yet, since that day that he heard of that good news, he has not ceased praying for them. And this is, for me, what stood out the most, because I'm like, why? Why are you, you heard, a good, you heard good news. Why are you, why are you praying for them? L- let them go. What about this person over here? No, Paul believes that prayer is a means of perseverance for God's people. So he keeps on praying. Reason three, Paul prays for right living and perseverance in that right living. I mean, verse 10, Paul prays that they might walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. And then in verse 11, he writes, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance or perseverance and patience with joy. So he prays for their good works and he prays that they might continue in those good works. The content of Paul's petition is for perseverance, but the fact that he is praying signals that prayer is a means for that perseverance. Reason number four, Paul is not praying alone. Epaphras was praying too. So Paul says that he labors to present everyone mature in Christ. 128. In 412, Paul concludes his letter by saying, Epaphras is always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. So how will the community reach maturity? They have to persevere. And Paul prays, and Epaphras is praying because they believe that prayer is a means by which God's people persevere. Reason five, Paul doesn't just pray, he requests prayer. So later in the letter, it's revealed that Paul is in prison. But what does he do? He says, hey, can you pray for me that I might continue to proclaim the gospel? So what is he saying? I believe in prayer so much as a means for perseverance. I don't just pray for you. I, ask, I, I want you to pray for me. I need your prayer so that I can continue. Because he believes that prayer is a means for perseverance. For Paul, prayer was important. What struck me as I began reading this text is, yo, this is good news. This church is bearing fruit. Move on. For me, um, when I hear bad news, I pray. Oh, man, you have cancer? Okay, let me pray for you. For Paul, when he hears good news, he prays. He doesn't just thank God. He does that, says that in verse 3, but he also prays. This past weekend, I had a 
a retreat with some of the leaders at our church. And we were talking about how we lead small group ministry. So small group ministry, what are some of the activities that we do to be a blessing to our small group? And one of the activities that came up was we, or some, have people write letters to themselves. So you start off the year and you write a letter to yourself. And this letter can include a lot of different things, like your goals, your prayer requests, your whatever, current situation, whatever it is. You can put it in that letter. And then in a few months, maybe a year, maybe longer, hey, I have something for you. And they give you that letter. You read it. You're shocked. Or maybe you're pleased. Oh, look, it happened. I had this goal, I had this prayer request, and look what happened. Or you're, wow, why didn't that happen? What was I doing? Where did, where did I go wrong? Imagine being confronted with who you are 10 years from now. Paul knows that prayer is a means for perseverance. So the way that someone gets from this point to this point, God has so orchestrated reality that the prayer is a means for that to happen. Like if you write a letter to yourself and read it, ask yourself, what would you want to see? You would want to see progress. Maybe you want to get married. Maybe you want to pass that class so you can graduate. Maybe you want to whatever. But the truth is, we don't know. We all change, but we don't know where we're going. We don't know. Will I even be alive next week? I don't know. I suspect that Paul wasn't privy to the information of the Colossian church, where they will be in 10 years or 20 years or decades later. No, he wasn't privy to that information. So he prays. He prays. He prays because he believes that prayer is a means for perseverance. You can start off well, like the Colossian church, but can you finish? And prayer for Paul was a way to start off well and to finish. So I want to move to this question, why persevere? Because, I mean, obviously, like, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. Why persevere to a church like this, building like this? But I think there are two main reasons why we should persevere from this passage. First, God provides all that we need to persevere. God has done the decisive work that was impossible for us to do so that we can have a relationship with him. The only aorist indicative verse, I hope, in this passage, meaning this has been done, it's been done, it's completed, are found in verse 13. Verse 13 says, He, referring to God the Father, has delivered you and transferred you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved Son. Verse 14 tells us that this beloved Son In him, we have redemption and forgiveness of sin. And verse 20 says that it's because he shed his blood on a cross. So that's how it happened. Blood was spilled so that you might be redeemed and transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And if we believe this message, we can have forgiveness and redemption. But then we discover that the treasure room is still open. There's more to be had. Romans 8.31 says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And you get a taste of that all things in verse 11. Paul prays that they are strengthened with the power, with all power, according to his glorious might. Another way to read this is that they might be empowered with all power, according to his glorious power. 
What for? What's all this power for? This power is for endurance, perseverance. So in addition to the things God has done that were impossible for us to do, God enables us to do what is necessary for perseverance. And how does that happen? Paul prays that they might receive this power so that they can persevere. Second, a second reason that we need to persevere. So the first reason God has provided all that we need, both his son and all power, both what was impossible and what is possible because he, en- he enables us. Second reason, in Paul's understanding of salvation, true faith is persevering faith. And these verses that I'm about to read are some of the most challenging verses for me as I read this letter. Colossians 1.21, And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. So how are alienated people, hostile people who do evil deeds, how are they presented holy before God? They are if they persevere in the faith, stable, steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel. So this is the same idea laid out in the book of Hebrews. It says, 314, for we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. What this means is that all those things that Paul heard about and praised at the beginning of this letter are only true if they persevere to the end. So why persevere? Because true faith True faith, real faith, faith that matters is faith that perseveres to the end. And this is hard. This is hard for me. I'm a pastor's kid. I grew up in the church. So I'm constantly asking myself, hey, what was that about? Why'd you do that? Why'd you lift your hands? Do you really believe? Is this convenient for you? John Murray, he writes, we must appreciate the lengths and the heights to which a temporary faith may carry those who have it. Or as one blogger put it, it's entirely possible to tack on biblical habits and religious-like affections to an utterly unsaved soul. That's crazy that you can be like a seminary student or professor or pastor, pastor's wife. You could be all those different things and not be saved. And people think you are. Paul is only repeating what Jesus taught his disciples. Paul prays that they bear fruit because if they don't continue to bear fruit, they will be thrown away like a branch and wither, as Jesus says in John 15, 6. Our fruit will be evidence that we abided in him, but we must keep bearing fruit, meaning our fruit must last. And the way I think about this is, you know, when I go to a grocery store, I pick up produce sometimes, and I take that produce, And the only produce that makes it into my car and into my house is fruit that isn't spoiled. That fruit, fruit that lasted, you know, from the tree all the way to my door. That's the only fruit I want. If it doesn't last, if it spoils before then, toss it. The farmer, he tosses it. It's not good. It's not going to sell. The grocery store, they toss it. I have two kids. 
We toss a lot of fruit sometimes because they don't eat it. Toss it. It's not good. So even though Paul has heard of this amazing good news from the church, he still prays that they might persevere because true faith perseveres. He prays that they would receive all that they need to persevere. He prays that they would believe, put their hope in the finished, complete work of Jesus. He prays that they would be empowered with the strength that he can provide them. And then he prays that they would persevere because true faith perseveres. So just two ways I want to apply this sermon. And what I'm about to say, I I mean no disrespect. I say it soberly, soberly and with much fear and trembling. I even debated whether I should even put this in here, whether I should use names or all those different things. But, you know, here I am. First Corinthians 10, 12 says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. And this past week, my friend sent me a bio from a conference speaker at a, from a small conference I used to go to. And this is what it said. And, and the reason why I hesitate to read this is because somebody might say this about me. In a few years. So there's a sobriety that I have when I read this, but I'll read it. Joshua's passion is making the truth of the Bible accessible and relatable and helping others discover the security, identity, and freedom of knowing God's love. His six books have sold over two million copies combined and have been translated into do- dozens of languages. Comparing himself to the fictional character Benjamin Button, who lived a backwards life, Joshua became a best-selling author at age 21, the lead pastor of a megachurch at age 30, and only now at age 40 is attending Regent College, an innovative graduate school of theology. And in recent news, you probably have heard that he no longer professes to be a Christian. And hindsight is twenty twenty, you know? Like, oh. Because I was sitting there wondering, like, what, did he know? When did he know? When did he realize, like, ah, actually, I don't think this is all for me. That Benjamin Button analogy seems to have gone too far. Like, his bio is so good. He's doing more things. He did more things than I will ever do if I had like five lifetimes, like he did more things in that short amount of time. And there's a possibility that he will return to Jesus. I pray he does. But a situation like this should make us pause and think, what about me? And I've wrestled with that question. Like what if everything, like even right now, like I am preaching, what if this is being done by an unregenerated heart. And I want to believe that if that is true, I will repent and trust Jesus to forgive me. But the question is, what about us? What about you? I think one way I've been wrestling with this is to really repeat these words back to myself from Robert McShane. Maybe they're familiar to you, but for every look at yourself, take 10 looks at Christ. Until I see Jesus face to face, I want to keep looking at him so much so that Jesus becomes both the goal and the means by which I persevere to see him face to face. See, by longing to see Jesus, I am setting him as the goal. But as I keep looking at him, that is the means that draws me closer to him. It's the means that pushes out sin in my life so that I might draw near to him. 
Paul's prayer reveals that my knee-jerk reaction of looking at myself, looking at my own heart, resting in my own bio, my own, oh, what did I accomplish today? That, that's not healthy. We were made to rest on the bio of Christ, the finished work of Christ. Think about that. Like, our eyes were made to see Christ and to rest there, not here. So, like, when I was on the board, or they invited me to join the board, right? And I'm like, yes. Yes. Like, there's this guy named Piper. I used to, like, listen to him on the radio. Now I'm in the room with him for hours. I was excited. I was so proud. Uh, Then this summer, I started hearing about prominent Christian leaders saying that they no longer profess to be Christians. So that tweaks something in my mind because now when people text me and say, hey, I see your name is on the Bethlehem program. Like, are you preaching at chapel? Hey, I want to come. This is a different story now. I'm a little more sober-minded. What does your bio say? And how much time do you spend on it? Our eyes should look at our bios only to praise what God has done to change them and then quickly go back to the one who changed it. Second point of application, then I'm done. Glorify God through prayer. Why is prayer one important means that God uses for the sake of his people persevering in their faith? It is because God gets the glory in answering the request. Like when I think of passages that kind of capture this idea, Jude comes to mind. You know, at the beginning he says, He writes to those who are kept, and then he says, hey, keep yourselves in the love of God. How? He says, by building yourselves up in the most holy faith and by praying in the Holy Spirit. Prayer. Keeping is related to prayer. Our prayers are an expression of faith that reveal that we believe God is our only hope to be kept by him. And God answers the prayer, proving that he was the only hope of being kept. So prayers to God and answered prayer by God reveal the glory and the necessity of God in persevering. Jude 24 says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. I'll conclude this way. I don't think he's here. But I sent this manuscript to one of my friends. He said he was coming. He's not. He's not here. (laughs) Great. Um, There's a gospel song I grew up listening to. He suggested that I sing it, but but because he's not here, I won't sing it. (laughs) The chorus goes, Lord, I'm running, trying to make 100 because 99 and a half won't do. And there's this like modernized version. And they say, this is, the, this is how the verse starts. This is the first verse of this song. On my knees every day. Lord, please hear me when I pray. Please forgive me when I stumble. Lord, I want to be in that number. And, you know, I don't know all the theological implications of that song, but I just know that there's, this song in my mind, captures what I'm trying to argue, that Paul 
believes that prayer is a means for perseverance. So he prays. And we should pray too. Paul's hope, our hope for persevering is not in ourselves. It's in God. And one way that we can express that is by praying. So, may we persevere in praying. And may we persevere in persevering. Let's pray together. God, you did not leave us without hope, but you offered your son. You offer your son. And with him, you offer us all things that we need for life and godliness. And I pray that you would continue to cause your people to persevere, that you would help us to see more of you and to persevere until we see you face to face, until our faith is made sight. I pray, God, for more so that we can endure. Um, God, we don't know what is to come. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds our tomorrow. So help us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.